This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 14 of season 3 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in Ayer a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, April 2nd, 1910. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1910. This section, uh, or this issue, starts with a uh, short section called Repairs at Town Hall. The $1,000 voted at the recent town meeting for repairs and renovations at the town hall is going to make it unavailable for some time, probably as much as six weeks from the time the work is commenced. The town fathers plan to have the work completed by Memorial Day, when the new soldier's monument is to be dedicated, and with the $500 voted for the occasion, it will be made an eventful affair. Therefore, those having meetings of various kinds coming the next few weeks are somewhat upset in their plans. The the Grange had degrees for a spring class of candidates, which requires two meetings, and its 50th anniversary celebration, for which it has rather elaborate preparations. This is to take place early in May. Just how these three events will be uh, compassed is not known at all at this writing. The Grange will hold its regular meeting Thursday night and the members will decide then. Probably these meetings will be condensed into a briefer space of time and the dances, dramatics, and other events scheduled will do the same if possible, making busy times for our good and faithful town hall janitor. The next section is Westford Center section. W.J. Merritt has a new automobile. It is an EMF touring car of 30 horsepower. I might mention the EMF automobile was named for the three principals of the company, uh, Barney Everett, William E. Metzger, and Walter E. Flanders. The company started production in 1908 and made a cooperative alliance with Studebaker the same year who would help market the EMF. By 1911, Studebaker EMF were second only to Ford in automobile production, and by 1912, EMF was merged into Studebaker. Easter Sunday, one of the best days in the church calendar, was fittingly observed at the Congregational Church Sunday. Mr. Wallace preached an inspiring and appropriate sermon from John 20, 16. The first anthem of the full choir was, The Lord of Life is Risen, and Mrs. C.D. Colburn sang a beautiful solo. The decorations were simple but effective, consisting of foliage, plants, Easter lilies, cut flowers, and pussy willows. At the evening service, there was a large attendance. H.G. Osgood made the praise service all that it should be, and Mr. and Mrs. Wallace sang a duet that was much appreciated. Edmund Baker, janitor of the Frost School and more recently of the Congregational Church, has now added the care of the Unitarian Church. This trio of buildings to keep cleaned, warmed, and lighted as needed will keep him reasonably busy. Uh, you, you may remember that in this period, or actually, actually after 1829, there were two churches in the center, the Unitarian Church, which is the church we know as the uh, first uh, church on the common today, and the the uh, newer Congregational Church that was founded in 1829 that is now where the CPA is located on Lincoln Street at the corner of uh, Boston Road. Miss Gertrude Hamlin from Miss Kimball's Home School for Girls at Worcester, Miss May Day from Mount Holyoke College, and Alistair McDougall from Amherst Agricultural College are those among our student young people who have been enjoying the spring vacation at their home. Miss Ruth Tuttle, Miss Mabel Drew, Miss Edna Ferguson, Miss Jenny Chandler are among the teachers who have been spending vacation days at home. Miss Eva Young, who has resided at Mrs. Helen K. Frost for a number of months, expects soon to return to her native England. Miss Young is a talented musician and goes to accept a fine position as an instructor. She has made many friends in our village who regret her departure and who sincerely wish her bon voyage. 
The next section is the Tadmuck Club. The excellence of the afternoon's program at the meeting of the Tadmuck Club at Library Hall Tuesday afternoon merited a larger attendance of the members than were present. Preparations for the Unitarian Social in the evening and prevalence of colds were among the contributing causes. It was one of those profitable and enjoyable biographical afternoons as was, and was in charge of Red, Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey with uh, American poet, novelist, traveler, and editor Thomas Bailey Aldrich as the subject. He was born in 1836 and died in 1907. With his characteristic scholarly thoroughness and fine diction, Mr. Bailey called the best from the life of Aldrich and sketched the different phases of his career, his boyhood, literary career, domestic life, and the position he maintained among the noted literary courtier of his day. Mr. Bailey illustrated his talk in, of the afternoon with several selections from the author in both prose and verse. At the preliminary exercises of the meeting, it was voted to be in line with other organizations of the town and have deposited in the copper box under the new soldier's monument a suitable souvenir from the club, and the secretary, Mrs. Woodward, was appointed to prepare such a document. The club was the outgrowth of a Tuesday reading class that was so pleasantly maintained for a number of seasons when Miss Eliza A. Babbitt, uh, who died in 1904, of blessed memory, was the leading spirit. Under her modest and able guidance, fuller and deeper meanings were gathered from the classics of Tennyson, Shakespeare, Browning, and others. Among the group that made up this class of congenial members were the names of Hall, Barnard, Cooper, Nye, Hildreth, Allen, Wheeler, Bailey, and Frost. After Mrs. Babbitt's lamentable death and Miss Loker's permanent residence in town, the members, with many additions, organized into the present club. It has never had or never desired but the one president, Miss Loker, who has tactfully and capably stood at the helm. It has never been over-ambitious in scope, in fact not identified with the larger federation of clubs, but its purposes have been thorough and earnest and dignified to those who have availed themselves of its opportunities. The next section is called Wedding. A very pretty home wedding took place at the home of Superintendent of Streets, Frankie Miller and Mrs. Miller, Wednesday afternoon when their older daughter, Mabel Blanche Miller, and Frank Austin Wright, son of Mr. and Mrs. Frank C. Wright, were united in marriage. The recent changes and renovations at the Miller home admirably adapted themselves to a pretty home wedding. There were about 40 present of relatives and friends. Refreshments were served after the ceremony of ice cream and cake. Mrs. Miller has been employed since completing her course at Commercial College at the W. W. Carey Company, Woodworking Machinery, Lowell, as stenographer, and Mr. Wright is employed, employed by the B&W, that's the Boston and Worcester Street Railway Company. The bridal party took the 640 train at Westford Station. They were conveyed thither to in Mr. Miller's barge with big white horses, their friends accompanying them to the, to the station. These young friends had trimmed and ornamented this conveyance to the extent of their ingenuity, and confetti was liberally used at the station. These young people take away with them into their new life the many earnest wishes of their friends for their happiness and prosperity. The next section is the About Town section. It's written by Samuel L. Taylor. Brunswick Roberts, a contractor in bridge building from San Francisco, California, has been visiting his sisters, his sister, Mrs. C.R.P. Decatur. Uh, the Decaturs lived in the Pelatiah Fletcher House on Lowell Road. He will return early in April with them. Early in April, and with them goes his niece, Miss Alma E. Decatur, who has won a reputation in Lowell as a skilled nurse. Her brother, Edward Decatur, has already been in California for a number of years. The auction at the residence of the late Theodore H. Hamblett, uh, which was on Brookside Road, opposite Brookside Mill, 
drew a large crowd on Saturday afternoon. Nearly everything sold at a good figure. A few pieces of mahogany furniture attracted appreciative lovers of the old fashion. The buildings with the few acres of land adjoining were bought by George C. Moore, the owner of the Brookside Mill. The house was bought was built by Mr. Hamlet, and he had lived there ever since the beginning of the Civil War. Charles Walker is enjoying a little trip, visiting relatives at Fitchburg, Natick, and Wellesley. Mrs. Seth W. Walker and two children from Chelmsford are staying with Miss Walker until her brother returns. On Sunday afternoon, there was a fire in the woods near Nutting Cemetery on land owned by the J.G. G. Abbott estate of Boston. This Abbott is spelled with a double T at the end, uh, unlike the Westford Abbots that only have one T at the end. It is thought the fire was started by someone throwing down a match. John Healy from Graniteville was promptly on hand, and with the help of the people in that vicinity, the fire was stopped after burning about two acres. John Hanley, John Healy, I'm sorry, it's Healy, not Hanley. John Healy was the head of the Graniteville Hose Company. F.S. Crafts, who has been employed by William H. Decatur on the Cutter Farm, has engaged with the sunny progressive Grieg Farms farmers on Main Street. Uh, that's the house uh, located right across the uh, Main Street from Fairview Cemetery and will occupy with his family the Brow Cottage on the Providence Road. Keep a watchful oversight of all accessible valuables while the assessor surprise you by suddenly coming upon you unawares the first day of April this year, as per Beacon Hill's new accessible plans. The assessors are kind people and will help you study the plan. There is much interest in the Drew Munson Fruit Association, which recently bought the Elmer E. Flagg place in Littleton. George A. Drew, a Westford boy, is one of the members of the firm. On Friday of last week, he gave a practical demonstration of the spraying of trees. It was a demonstration conducted by the state for instructing people in the best methods of spraying, pruning trees, etc. Next is the Forge Village section. A very pleasant birthday party was held Saturday evening at the home of Mr. and Mrs. David Lord, the occasion being the 21st birthday anniversary of their daughter, Miss Eva May Lord. A large number of her friends were present. Supper was ser served at 6.30, after which a musical evening was enjoyed. Miss Lord was the recipient of many dainty and valuable gifts from her friends. Miss Catherine McNiff, niece of John McNiff, and Mrs. Feely and little son arrived Wednesday of last week from Keithley, England. They will make their home for the present with Mr. and Mrs. McNiff. Uh, many of the listeners will know Mickey Crocker. Her maiden name was McNiff, and I believe the John McNiff uh, mentioned here is Mickey's grandfather, who came to Westford in November of 1909, as recorded in the Westford Wardsman. The name is spelled here, M-C, capital N-I-F-F, -F, but I believe it's the correct spelling is M-C, capital K-N-I-F-F. -F. Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. McNiff entertained the following persons at their home Saturday and Sunday. Richard Feely, Bernard McCann, James O'Neill, and Mr. and Mrs. Mullen, all of Lowell. A slight fire was started Sunday morning near the residence of Fred Reed, which, owing to the dry condition of the leaves and grass, spread quickly. The fire was soon noticed and put out by Mrs. Reed and several young ladies who had lingered after the services at St. Catherine's Church. Miss Sarah Northrup and William French of Pepperell and John Martin, uh, M-A-R-T-O-N is the way it's spelled, of Lowell were Easter Sunday guests of Mr. and Mrs. Ke Fenimore Morton. So I, I suspect John Martin should be John Morton, but it's not spelled that way. The property of the late George H. Prescott is to be put up at auction. 
Reverend William E. Gardner, Department Secretary for New England of the Board of Missions, gave a very interesting address Wednesday evening in St. Andrew's Mission on the good work done by the missionaries all over the world. He spoke particularly on the need of Christian Christianity among the Chinese and Japanese. The money donated by the children's mite boxes will be used for this purpose. Next is a section on Easter services. Easter Day was appropriately observed in St. Andrew's Mission. There was a large gathering at the early morning communion service and at the Sunday school service at 3.30, the children's mite boxes were collected. In the evening, the pretty chapel was much too small to accommodate the large number who wished to attend. The vested choir, with an additional choir of small girls in white dresses and cotters and their little caps, made the scene very impressive. At the offertory, the children sang Easter bells in an able manner. The song, uh, the hymn, He is Risen, was sung by the regular choir. Miss Teresa Lowther and Miss Edith Precious sustained the solos. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher preached a fine sermon on the resurrection of Christ. By special request, the children will sing again in the choir next Sunday, when several of the little tots will be heard in solos. Next is the Graniteville section. The local fire department was called out to a brush fire in the northern part of the town early Sunday afternoon. The fire was in woodland owned by John Healy, who lives in the so-called Daniel Ward place. The fire burned about two acres before it was got under control by the firemen and a large force of neighbors in the vicinity. It is thought the fire was started by someone carelessly dropping a lighted match in the woods. Uh, this is actually the third brush fire that's mentioned in this issue of the Wardsman. It, it must have indeed been a dry April. The Graniteville Baseball Club will open the season here on Patriots Day, April 19th at 3 p.m. when they will meet a team known as the Jolly Campers, composed mostly of members of the former Sanctuary Choir of Lowell. There are some good ball players among the Jolly Campers, and an interesting contest is looked for. The Graniteville Club will be greatly strengthened this season and is anxiously waiting for the words, play ball. There's another section on Easter services in the Graniteville churches. The glorious festival of Easter was fittingly observed in both churches in this village on Sunday. At 9.45 o'clock in the morning, a high mass was celebrated in St. Catherine's, Catherine's Church by Reverend J. J. McNamara. The full choir, under the direction of Miss Mary T. Hanley, sang special music for the occasion, the solos being sustained by R. J. McCarthy, Miss Rebecca LaDuc, and Miss Sadie Smith. The services in the Methodist Episcopal Church commenced at the usual hour, 1045, and the pastor, Reverend Louis Havermail, delivered an eloquent sermon from the theme, Stones Rolled Away. The senior choir, under the direction of Henry Smith, sang special music, and considering the fact that this choir has been but recently reorganized, did excellent work, the solos being sustained by Mr. Smith, Frank Conter, Miss Mildred Lorman, and the Misses Lily Matron and Bertha Wilson. There was a large audience in attendance. The evening service consisted of a short talk on what Easter means by the pastor, a brief musical program which proved to be very pleasing. That's the news in Westford for the week ending April 2nd, 1910. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman po podcast. Thank you.